Tim Page currently holds a joint professorship in both the Thornton School of Music and the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and this is, of course, at uh, USC, University of Southern California. Uh, Tim won the Pulitzer Prize uh, in 1997 when he was doing his writing at the Washington Post. Uh, and before that, he served as chief music critic for Newsday uh, and also as a music and cultural writer for the New York Times. Um, during his years in New York, he was also the host of a program at WNYC in New York uh, and many interviews with composers and performers and um, along, I, I believe those are still available to hear as, as I understand. Online, online, online yeah, yeah, a lot of them. Um, he, we were just chatting backstage, he was a, we share something in common, we were both um, uh, um, alumni of the St. Louis Symphony. He was an artistic advisor and creative chair um, for a couple of years there, or a year or two there. And then of course he also had a short stint here at Peabody for a couple of years. He has to his credit more than 20 books, um, you know, the subjects ranging from Glenn Gould, Virgil Thompson. Uh, and some others that we'll also talk about. He is also currently, numerous awards, I'm not gonna go through them all because there's so many. Uh, he is currently a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. And, you know, first of all, there, there's, there's just so much for us to talk about. Um, and one of the things that I did, you know, as I was, as I was, you know, getting ready, as we were getting ready for this symposium was reread your, you know, I read through your, your Tim Page on Music, the collection of reviews and previews and, and postscripts and, and whatnot. And then I also had an opportunity to read Parallel Play. Um, and I have to just say that, that you know, um, and I don't say this to everybody, you, you, are, you are really a wonderful writer. And I, you know, I'd read your Thank stuff for many so years, but I, in getting reacquainted <clears throat> with it, you know, and kind of reading a lot of it at one time, um, it's just a, it's just a, uh, you know, wonderful style and so interesting all the time. So, you, uh, you know, I, I guess what I want to ask you or begin at least to talk about is your career as a critic, because you know, since you spent, you know, Lyons part of your career doing that, um, what do you think about the state of music criticism today? Um, you, you probably know Tim Smith here at the Sun has just, has just yes. retired. Yes, I and understand. Fine we, critic. Yeah, and, and also, you know, um, as, as you know, Pierre, you know, this is no longer in, in Atlanta, and Minneapolis lost their critics, although, you know, fewer and fewer cities actually have full-time critics. Um, so on the surface, it doesn't look good. What's your view of all of it? What do you think the future looks like for this? And we go from there. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much for the generous introduction and for the invitation back to Peabody. I, I must say, I'm, uh, I, I always liked working at Peabody, but it's, it's remarkable how much it's changed and how, what a, a lively place it, it has become. Uh, and it's also great being back in Baltimore, which was my home when I worked at the Washington Post. I decided I thought this was a much cooler town than Washington, <laughs> yeah. and I would just uh, take the train down, stay over if I needed to, but uh, I have enormous fondness for the city. Criticism. Um, to fall back on the Dickens line, it's the best of times and worst of times. More, more if you actually want to get paid to be a critic, closer to the worst of times. <laughs> um, however, there are things to be said about what's going on now. And I think it's above all a time of enormous transition. Um, I don't know what we're going to see when, um, uh, you know, when everything reaches whatever state it seems to be becoming. Um, I, I, I would say it's very, very hard to get a music critic's job now. I started in 1979, and back then, the New York Times had eight people writing about classical music. Uh, the Daily News had one staff critic on classical music and stringers. Uh, there was a staff classical music critic, the late Harriet Johnson at the New York Post, and three very distinguished um, uh, stringer critics, which means that you're paid by the piece, uh, one of whom went on to run the, the Seattle Opera for many years, Spate Jenkins. Mm -hmm. uh, 
everybody had a music critic. They were all over the place. Little tiny giveaway newspapers had their music critics. And most of that is gone um, for, for reasons which are sad in many ways, especially for those of us who love to sit down in the morning and crinkle a newspaper and open it up and see what's going on in the world. On the other hand, information moves so much more quickly now than it did. Uh, and the internet has allowed people to be their own critics. I mean, there are a lot of places you can write online. You probably won't get paid for it, unfortunately, which means that it's, it, it becomes sort of a, I, I won't say amateur, but sort of a hobbyist mm -hmm. type situation. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, um, by the time I was at the Times, and especially when I was at the Washington Post, I was usually the only voice there that was going to write about whatever happened. Uh, and that's changed a bit. There are all sorts of opera sites. There are local sites. Um, there is San Francisco Classical Voice. There is Charles Downey's wonderful page down in Washington. Uh, I think he covers Baltimore, too. Um, and so there are options for people to really weigh in on performances and start a real dialogue going where people can actually talk with each other and, and you know, volley back and forth about the merits of a performance. And I'm fascinated by this. I, I, I'm, I, I fear I'll sound rather day class A by saying this. If you go to an Amazon site and you look at all the people who have reviewed recordings, books, things like that. Some of them will, of course, not be interesting at all. Some of them will be pretty much scatological. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the ones that aren't, the ones that are, attract people who really, really know about this artist or this situation or this historical um, uh, event, are, are really amazing. And then I also think of, of, say, something like Wikipedia, where you get these people who will actually give you 2,000, 3,000 words on all the different tube stops in London. And, you know, it, it's just amazing. It, it, it allows people, and I'm one of these people, who has a lot that he's really, really interested in and that he wants to say about things. Um, and uh, there's an outlet for it. So I don't know how, how it finally comes around that there are people who actually make livings as music critics anymore. I'd say there are probably about 10 full-time classical music critics in the United States at this point, much more in Europe still. But um, I don't know how it will happen exactly, but I do think you know, that we're, we're just dealing with such a time of change and something will happen and the dialogue will certainly go on and in many ways much more intimate, much more thoughtful than it did where there was one big newspaper and one critic and that critic's word was considered the final word on something. It's never the final word and any honest critic will admit that. Uh, and now, uh, obviously, we have a chance where other people can weigh in. Yeah, it's interesting because in some ways it really is analogous to a lot of things that you know we certainly talk about here and are talking about as we think about training young musicians yes. for the future because this whole idea, of, even if you think about the recording industry, I mean, you can create your own, the middleman is gone in a sense. Yes, you know, it is. You can create your own film, you can create your own recording, you can do it relatively easily. And so that both presents challenges in terms of how do you monetize it, mm -hmm. but also it presents a real opportunity in terms of getting your work out there in a way that maybe you couldn't before. Absolutely, and I, th I think in the long run that this is gonna be a very good thing. First of all, the major classical labels with occasional exceptions were spending massive amounts of money on things that really, really didn't matter anymore and they were just I mean, uh, let, me, let me give an analogy. Um, I love Hamlet. I think it's a fabulous play, an amazingly great play. It, it, every time I watch it, I learn more. Mm -hmm. But the classical music was business was becoming a little bit like 
the film business, if the film companies, say United Artists made a Hamlet this year, and then the year after that, Paramount would make a Hamlet, and, and, and it would just go on and on, and who would go see their fifth Hamlet in five years yep. that they spent millions and millions of dollars making? And the same thing was happening with the record business. There were so many versions of the Beethoven symphonies uh, on these uh, on these labels, um, and the idea of making a new one, which would cost say two million dollars, perhaps, to get a big orchestra to make a new recording of the the Beethoven Nine Symphonies. This is nothing against Beethoven Nine Symphonies, believe me. Um, but the idea that you would go spend all that money when you had these amazing conductors and orchestras already in the catalog. What it should have inspired the record companies to do was to go out and really find new repertory and do different things. And there are some record companies that did that. Um, but, you know, figure a, a set of the Beethoven Nine symphonies now, which would cost about $2 million, would likely sell about 25000 copies worldwide. That'd be a lot, probably. And, and if they charged you for how much it costs, you would probably have to pay, I don't know, $50,000 for your set <laughs> if, if there was going to be any profit. So it, so it just didn't work. I like the fact that people don't, don't have to just wait for some big record company to come down and say, you are our next composer. I, I like the fact that the power has been taken away, for the most part, from those people. The same way I like the fact that if we turn on our television, we just don't have NBC, CBS, ABC, and PBS, which is the way I grew up. And we didn't have any way of recording um, the shows. So you had to actually make serious decisions about what you wanted to see that evening. Um, and I love the fact that we don't have the, this kind of top-down management. The big difference is when you and I were kids, we all knew the same shows because they were mm -hmm. what was on last night. We all get very excited and talk about this. And now when you have you know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of different channels, there isn't that same kind of community. But I'm not sure that that's going to be a permanent thing because I think we are making our own communities with Facebook pages devoted to, you know, uh, forgotten singers. And, mm -hmm. you know, you find your way there. When I was a kid interested in forgotten singers, you know, every five or six years, RCA Victor would release another Caruso record and I'd be grateful and I'd grab it. But now you can see anything you want. You can see you know, you don't even have to order for it. It's all there. And I think that would have made my life very different. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is amazing. I, I always talk about YouTube and going on YouTube, and you can find absolutely anything, you know, in terms of music and performers. Yeah. I mean, it, and it really does, I mean, it has, you know, it's opened up the world so much. Absolutely. So um, coming back to your criticism, what I, what I, one of the things I really appreciate about the way you write is um, the lack of jargon in the writing. Thank you. And, and the fact that it's very substantive and very on point, but also very accessible. And, and, and I don't quite know how you do it, but you do it. And, um, and you're also not, you know, you're not, you know, I mean, I've lived my life around a lot of music critics and, and you're not gratuitously nasty or snippy. Thank you. You, you know, and, but you're also, you're also very clear about what you appreciate and what you appreciate less. I, I, in rereading your, I, I, it was like, it was interesting, it was like, no to Horowitz. No to, <laughs> not <laughs> really. Not really, no, but, 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 yeah. but, but kind of no. no to, certainly no to Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yes. Uh, y yes to Rubenstein, particularly the 1960s. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, yes to Frank Sinatra. Yes. Yes to Captain Beefheart. Yes. And I wasn't quite sure about what you thought about Paul McCartney. So, so. I, I actually like a lot of Paul McCartney. I just think hiring an orchestrator to, to write a piece for you, and then, and filling it with not 
not great Paul McCartney melodies is just sort of a bad idea. So, so how did you, how did your act, how did your style actually evolve? I mean, who did you learn from? Who did you admire? How did you sort of evolve? Well, I, I I'll start with when I actually became a critic because I had two very significant critical mentors. Uh, one was John Rockwell, who hired me for the New York Times as a stringer. And the other one, who just loved my work and bragged about it and, and worked me, with me very closely, was Virgil Thompson, um, who was also a composer. And they were hugely influential. But I have to say, in this, as in almost everything else I did, I was self-taught. Mm -hmm. I was this, you know, I was that weird, and I may be, have been uniquely weird, little kid who wanted to go to the music library and take out all the books by James Gibbons Huneker and H.L. Mencken on music, and you know, all these critics who, who found ways to, um, to write about this, this art that mystified me, but, but also made me alive, made me feel that I was you know, being taken into, uh, t taken to worlds that I didn't necessarily discover. I, I, I'm going to do a very quick little, um, little shift here. I've made no secret of the fact that I was diagnosed with uh, autism when I was 45. And, um, it, well, they called it Asperger's syndrome there, which is now no longer the words they use. But... I didn't understand the world when I was a kid, you know? I would, the only thing which would calm me down because I was, I was rather prone to tantrums and just getting angry and being utterly confused by what other people thought was interesting and, and that. And my mother was kind enough to let me ruin her records and eventually her record player by putting on music. And I would find that if I put on music I could understand tenderness because I was, you know, one of these closed up little kids who was always nervous and and I remember weeping the first time I ever heard the Vaughn Williams Fantasia on green sleeves because it it somehow melted me and I understood human tenderness. Uh, and I had all sorts of ideas about music. And you know, obviously, I, I knew nothing about you know eras or the tonic dominant or anything like that when I was a kid. But to a four-year-old's perspective, I really learned as much as I could, and I learned independently. Then, when I was about nine, uh, the the librarians at the University of Connecticut, whose names will be forever hallowed in my mind allowed this, you know, funny little kid to come in and listen to records and take things out and and do things like that. And so I started... That your dad taught it. My dad taught at University of Connecticut. And I brought the books home. I brought the scores home. I play things on the piano. Um, but one thing that happened was I started getting interested in avant-garde music and, and contemporary music, and I didn't understand it. So when my mother would give me a book, about contemporary music, or, or, or rather a, a record of contemporary music. Um, I would play it over and over, and then I would go upstairs to my room and try to write about it, and write about what interested me and find some way of communicating it in words. Because I, 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 I've always been able to talk about music. I can't talk about a lot of things, but music and internal response to music is something I can talk about um, very closely. So all my criticism back then was just right sitting there with a you know touch type early electric, one of those big bulbous things that looked like they were designed by R. Crumb, and I would I would just work on that and I would write and I would write and I would write and then. All of a sudden, when I was out of college, and I'd, I'd done a double major in music and, uh, and English, I just sent off a piece I'd written to a sort of a city paper type village voice thing called the Soho Weekly News. And they loved it. And they said, my gosh, you're making music alive. And so 
Um, it, they didn't have a lot of classical music coverage, but they liked my work, and I was there for a while until I was, I was brought in at the Times. And you know, if I were 24 again, and I was looking 40 years in the future, and I was told that I was a music critic for that time, I, w I wouldn't have thought that would have been what happened. But it is what happened, and I don't think I would have been disappointed at 24. I've had a chance to write about the art which I love profoundly, one of the arts I love profoundly, and I've managed to speak my piece, and I've made mistakes, but you know, it's, uh, it's uh, sort of an autobiography of the heart. So, you, I mean, your career as a writer is interesting because you spent the first part, much of your career, writing about other people, and then about 10 to 12 years ago, you started to write about yourself, first with the first piece with The New Yorker about yes. your Asperger's, and then the book, Parallel Play, and then even most recently after your brain injury, the piece that you wrote. Um, I forget who you wrote it for. What, I wrote it for a 21st Century Musician, okay. yeah. which is a wonderful um, thing. And it, it's actually run by a, st a student of mine, or she's one of the people who runs it, uh, Elizabeth Nonamaker, who attended, um, who I worked with in California, and some of you probably know her. She's a wonderful composer and has become a wonderful writer, and I've been pleased to be able to help somewhat on that along those lines. So what's it like to write about others versus writing about yourself? And was it a hard decision to, to write about the Asperger's? And what was it like to do that? Um, well, that, that was a strange one because it was one of these crisis moments in my life and uh, I had been talking with David Remnick, who's the editor of The New Yorker, about doing some pieces for him and this was one thing I'd written about was in 2000, my, my middle boy, who had had a terrible, terrible 10 years, and had been, um, had been diagnosed as schizophrenic, ADHD, all sorts of these things. And we finally got a doctor who really looked hard at him and saw his ability to absorb massive amount of data. Um, and uh, so I'd been coming up from, I was living in Baltimore, uh, or, or, or Washington at that point. And I would come up to New York and I'd go in and we'd have long talks with the, with the therapist. And the therapist started describing this condition, this condition of a, a extraordinary memory, uh, a sometimes rather awkward personality, uh, the ability to throw yourself wildly into something that made you interested. And he diagnosed my, my son, Rob, and I didn't write about this because Rob was a child, but Rob is now 28 and doing very well and you know, quite proud of the fact that he's, a, he's an Aspie or an autistic person. So now I talk about it. But the doctor diagnosed Robbie and explained the whole condition to him. I'm sitting there. Hmm, this sounds <laughs> familiar. <laughs> and so he, he talks to Robbie, and he, he knew me pretty well by then because I'd been coming up pretty much every week to see the doctor. And, uh, and so he diagnosed Robbie, and then he turned to me and he said, and you have this too. And it was one of those weird times. You know, when you go to a doctor and you're terrified about getting a diagnosis, and you get a diagnosis, it's, it's usually not something that you're overly thrilled about. But for me, it suddenly made sense of why I was so good at some things and so terrible at others. He mentioned the St. Louis Symphony. The, the story I told about myself then was that I was a really troubled kid who'd pulled himself together and he'd won a Pulitzer and he worked at the New York Times, and he'd started a record label and made film. And so I was kind of cocky. And then I, I didn't realize that the reason I'd been successful at these things was because they all involve privacy and hard, solitary work by myself. And suddenly I'm in a place where I have to remember the names of all the different 
artists there, and I, I am almost face blind to begin with. I just don't, for, until I've met somebody a few times and something else clicked, I'm just not very good at faces. Um, and so I was a disaster, and so I'd come back and I was aching. And, but then I learned about this, and I learned how to structure my life from then. Learned that, well, what I was good at was, was doing intensive work. I was good at working alone. I was sort of a solo flyer. Um, and uh, it helped me figure out how to live my life from then on, how to... You know, if I know I have to go to a party, parties are about the most difficult thing for me. This is not difficult at all. And I, I have no trouble, you know, talking to the camera and the world out there. Um, but I do have trouble just going into a place where I know nothing about anybody and no one knows anything about me. And I'm just trying to make small talk. I, I sort of look at my shoes and then, you know, sneak out as quickly as I could. Someone was saying, you know, when you're a kid, you lie to get out of the house and go to a party. And once you're an adult, you lie to get out and go home. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I have to say, I, I don't usually lie about it. I just say, I, I can't do this. I'm overwhelmed. Um, and so... I can now make deals with myself. I can, I can talk myself into saying, I'm going to go to a party. I'm going to have a friend there. I'm going to stay for about half an hour. I will shake a number of people's hands. I will introduce myself to a number of people. And I get through it, and then I sort of flee. Um, so if I know what's going to happen to me, I'm fine. I'm, I'm terrible with surprises. <laughs> I'm terrible with things like that. I like control. I like knowing how routines work uh, and following them. And uh, in any event, that made me, um, that helped me. Mm -hmm. So um, the other, um, some of you may have seen the other night, uh, um, Tim did a wonderful talk with uh, Kay Jemison, and um, who was a, you know, uh, a great thinker on, on mood disorders and has written of her own experience there, of course, as a professor over at uh, Hopkins Medicine. And you were talking, I was struck by when you were talking about how you pick your topics. And the, the subject of Don Powell came up. And, and so, you know, one of the questions are, how do you pick your topics? And I know that you also mentioned that you'll often look back on the topics you picked and say, I'm not sure how I got there. Yeah. Or what was <laughs> you know? So what? How how does that work? I I should give a brief introduction to Dawn Powell. She's a marvelous, marvelous American novelist, diarist, um, playwright, um, an extraordinary figure. And I read something about her, and I was fascinated by her. And I was so bored with writing about music all the time. So Newsday let me write a long piece about her by after which I came to know her surviving family. And I have to say, we put together a pretty great revival of her. And if you had told me a week before, you're going to discover this writer named Dawn Powell, and you're going to spend the next four or five years of your life working on this, I would have been very surprised. And even now, I'm finally forgetting all the details, which I used to have. I used to be able to tell you exactly what year the book was published. Um, and I was the same way when I was a kid. I was obsessed with the dates of Caruso recordings, <laughs> of silent films. I, I basically, at this point, I leave myself open to things that I find fascinating. And, you know, obviously, if it's some huge subject, I won't, um, I won't necessarily go with it. But if, but if it's something I feel I can do, uh, and do something interesting with it, um, I'll just jump on it because I, I see so often, and perhaps this is the autistic thing, I see all these things that fascinate me, which nobody else seems to find very fascinating. Um, <laughs> and so someone has to do it. And I, I take on the mantle and I do it, and I'm, I'm, proud, of the, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I have collected the writings of a deeply devout Nobel Prize winning Norwegian 
woman author named Sigrid Unset, and I've collected the writings of a American sort of agnostic preacher, uh, often called an atheist, I wouldn't necessarily go with that, named Robert G. Ingersoll, mm -hmm. who was somebody who did the Chautauqua circuits and um, was very anti-Puritan at the very least. And, you know, they're radically different. And people say, how can you do that? You know, and it's just like, I, I wanted to do it, you know, and I was interested. And I don't know why, but, but, you know, if there's something that really interests me, you know, it's like making a friend. It's not something you sit down and you make notes. Is this the, the, the best person? Is this the person who the, has the least flaws who mm. can get me this? You know, you just meet somebody and you like them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great answer. So speaking of meeting people, um, and there are so many people we could talk about, but I have to ask you ab about Glenn Gould. Especially today. Yes, I know you were, you were saying what, t well, tell them. I got a call <clears throat> from a person, uh, for, first an email, but, but then I, she asked to talk and I called her. And she said, you know, I think I have the score that Glenn Gould used to make the second recording, the second commercial recording of the Goldberg Variations. And she was very nice. We had a good long talk. But the whole time I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, yep, sure. <laughs> and anyway, I talked to her, and she explained something of the circumstances behind it, which I'm not really at liberty to say. But then she took some pictures, and she sent them to me. And, you know, I knew Glenn quite well. We were very good friends. We did a somewhat famous interview on the... Goldberg variations on his two different recordings. And uh, she sent me the pictures and I looked at them and it's Glenn, you know? So after that, um, she got very nervous. She didn't want her name known or anything like this. Um, but she, she reached an auction house called Bonhams. And as we speak, that I, I went to Bonham's because they also agreed that it was legitimate, but I authenticated it with one condition. I did not want it being sold to some, you know, some insanely rich person who is going to run off with it and keep it in the wine cellar for the next 100 years or something like that. The only way I would authenticate it was if really, really superb Photo photographs were made of it and that they were made available to the public. And frankly, Bonhams was terrific. Bonhams agreed to make the huge photographs. I mean, th there's such good photographs that this little, little, you know, score can be blown up to fill this whole back wall. They have a window at, on Madison Avenue, which will probably be coming down in a few hours. Uh, with the score right in the middle of it, and it is being auctioned right now, and I have no idea what it's going to go for, but the thing that makes me proud is that I did think to say this has to go to the Library of Canada. There have to be, you know, uh, images of this because, you know, it's the guy who did these two magnificent recordings of the Goldberg Variations and scholars and just people who are interested in Glenn, and there are a lot of people interested in Glenn, um, will want to see this. And so I'm very proud I was able to do that. And we'll see how much it goes for this afternoon. This has been such a wild day for me, but it's a very good day. I'm just happy to see you, happy to talk about Glenn, happy to talk with any of you about anything you'd like. How'd you meet him? How did I meet him? The Soho News had a circulation of 30,000, and he agreed to give two interviews on the 25th anniversary of his career with Columbia. And, but the rule he made was he wanted to get some sense of what the person would ask him about, because he was rather 
skeptical of the press because they'd say, why do you sing when you play? Or <laughs> when are you going to make your historic return to Carnegie Hall? And, and they didn't get it. He was out of concert giving for life. He had quit in 1964. This was 1980, so it had already been 16 years. He'd answered all these things. He was mocked by a lot of critics. I liked Harold C. Schoenberg very much, but he really mocked Glenn, and, um, and that was what was going on. So I wrote him a note and said, you love the late works of Strauss, which were then rather unfashionable. I love the late works of Strauss, so that was one thing. We talked about his idea of using radio and the spoken voice to make music, what he called contrapuntal radio. And I, so I asked him all the things that other people didn't ask him, and I took his uh, decision not to give concerts seriously. I took him at his word, and I didn't talk about that. And so he said, all right, so I'm giving it to, I think he gave one to Esquire magazine, not the New York Times at that point, which would have put it all over the world. And he gave it to the, the little Soho News with the absolutely unknown Tim Page. And it was supposed to be a half hour interview. It turned into four hours. Mm -hmm. Immediately, he said, I said, oh, Mr. Gould. He's like, nah, no, 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 no. Glenn. The name is Glenn. <laughs> and so it was Glenn and Tim from there on. And he always called late at night. And we'd always talk for hours and hours. And we grew to be very good telephonic friends. And then I met him when I came up to do the interview. He did shake my hand. He eventually <laughs> looked in my eye. But I'm, I'm convinced, and I've actually written an article about this, um, which, which can be found online. Um, I'm convinced that Gwen and I understood each other because, I, and I found nobody who knew Gwen well who disappears with it, that we both had a touch of autism. Mm. And, uh, and the fact that we could sit there and talk about what was, how amazing Metamorphosin or the Oboe Concerto by Strauss was. And we get, oh, and then there's this recording and there's this recording. Mm. And he was very childlike, you know. He presented this austere master of the North image, but he was really like an unbelievably 10 or 11 year old, unbelievably brilliant. <laughs> who would just, yeah, 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 and did you see this? And, and he had this silly, silly sense of humor, and I loved him. We, we, we just got along like gangbusters, and he's, he's one of the people I still consider one of my great, great mentors, and I revere his memory, mm -hmm. and I'm happy that this, this score is being sold today, now that it's taken care of, and I hope that the woman who has been quite impoverished um, will have a good life with whatever you know it, it sells for. But it'll always be available to you and to the world. That's wonderful. So um, I want to open it up to some questions from all of you so you can get in the conversation as well. And um... Nothing is off the record. <laughs> One, once you've written a memoir, you, you realize that you really don't have much to hide behind. <laughs> no, you really pretty much tell it all in that. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yep. You know, and the nice thing about the memoir, and the nice thing about writing Parallel Play was, I, and you asked this question, I don't think I answered it, I was terrified how people would react. Mm. And the love I received, and the p letters I would get, and the people who... You know, and some of my old friends said, now I get it, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, has, has, has been one of the things that has meant most to me in, in the last dozen years. So shoot away. <laughs> yeah, Scott. We 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 we've, we've, Philip Philip and I have done probably I don't know fifty interviews or more. It was I think it was one of yours where he said the line about uh, you don't have to like my music. There's plenty of music. I think that comes from that interview. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about how you met him and how that relationship developed over time? And, and I know you mentioned you wrote material for him as well. 
Oh, I've, I've, done, I've done so much with Philip. I mean, my first job in music was copying the part writing for Satyagraha. Uh, six dollars, uh, six flight walk up in the hottest summer on record at that point. <laughs> um, what happened with Philip was I transferred out of the Manus School of Music to Columbia. And I quickly discovered that there was this radio station there called WKCR. And nobody was playing anything by contemporary composers in the musical capital of America at that point. And I had seen the, the, uh, the American premiere of Einstein on the Beach, and I'd seen the American premiere of Music for 18 Musicians, and I knew all the downtown people. Uh, I knew their work anyway. And, and you know, they were all listed. And I realized I had a radio station that had the potential of re reaching 20 million people. And so it, I'm very pragmatic. <laughs> and it was like, aha. And so Philip's listed. And I write him a note. And I say, you know, can I talk to you? Um, I want to present all of Einstein on the beach without any commercial interruption, all four hours of it. And, you know, Philip being absolutely no dummy and having no one else playing his music at that point, um, said, sure. <laughs> and so I, I got everybody's pieces. And, you know, I, 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 in fairness, I also did Elliot Carter premieres, and I did interviews with Milton Babbitt, Vincent Persichetti, Meredith Monk, Dizzy Gillespie, the list goes on and on. Pretty much if you were involved in music in the 80s, and early 90s, I knew you. Uh, and it was, it was a really wonderful thing. And then all of a sudden, the city station, which was WNYC, decided they were going to put a big chunk of new music in. And I was brought over to, to take care of that and manage that. And you know, we just, we just presented all this music at a time when you really couldn't hear it. You know, um, most of, and you know, I, I got everybody's private tapes of things that they did when they were very young. And I, I, unfortunately, huge amounts of those tapes are lost because WNYC had no money then. And I recognized we were doing something historic, but they didn't. And so we would just finish something up and then we would we would bulk the tape and do it again which is horrible i i'm still looking for one that i did with milton babbitt which i was oh. very proud of where i had him on and i asked him to take me through american popular song and milton who wrote like oh yes well this is the you know the very technique the inverse retrograde of da 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 and so i played him irving berlin and he would babbitize these <laughs> songs and it was fabulous. We just laughed and laughed. I'm sure that one's going to show up because, because that's a famous one. But, but, but it was wonderful. It's two hours of Milton putting that magnificent, logical positivist, as he always called himself, brained at the service of Gershwin and Irving yeah. Berlin and some Tin Pan Alley composers and coming out with uniquely Milton descriptions. Pretty good pianist, too. Very good pianist, and, yeah. a, and a very funny, interesting yeah. guy. Yeah. I like Milton a lot. So, so that's a good segue. I mean, uh, who do you, who do you think are the interesting composers today? And I'm asking really in any genre. Uh, you know, I'm certainly in, in what we would consider the you know contemporary classical music, but but in any genre, who do you listen to? Well, it's again, it's still curious. Um, it's it's a group of people. I'm a bit of a dinosaur now, I'm 64, and there are some things which I'm not used to listening to, but I like listening to. I like D'Angelo quite a bit when I heard it. Um, I wrote a big long piece about Stephen Merritt and magnetic fields, uh, which I'm pretty proud of. Uh, I like a group called Ockerville River very much. They have they write wonderful lyrics, some of the most poetic, interesting lyrics. I'm dazzled by Dylan's late period. Mm -hmm. Dylan is still doing such interesting work. 
And I think one of the reasons why he still does interesting work, and I think this about Neil Young too, is that they're, neither of them are afraid to fall absolutely flat on their face. They never went around to just doing Bob Dylan music or Neil Young music. They'll, I mean, got, some of the Neil Young recordings are pretty much unlistenable. But then there'll be another one which will be very, very listenable. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because they're still out there sort of stimulating themselves. I am passionate over a much neglected singer-songwriter named Judy Sill, J-U-D-E-E -E Sill. They're making a documentary about her. They've reissued her work. I've tried to champion her. She sounds like some mixture of Mahalia Jackson, um, country music, <laughs> Brian Wilson, and Vivaldi. Um, <laughs> And she writes all this kind of hippie religious lyrics, and she died very young of an overdose. But she was a genius, and you know, somebody who you you put on a Judy Sill record, and you know immediately that that it's somebody who's very special, who who will not be able to be um, replaced. Uh, and it's and it's marvelous. And then. Then again, I, you know, my, my kids send me things, and I suddenly love it. I mean, you know, you, you put on That's Not My Name by the Ting Tings, and I'm dancing around the room, you know? I mean, it's, it's silly pop, but it's silly pop that hits me right where I live. What do you think about Kendrick Lamar winning the Pulitzer Oh, I Prize? thought it was wonderful. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I, I, and, you know they, they came to me, and I was amazed that so many of the younger critics were like, oh no, this is terrible, this is awful. I, I, I confess that I don't entirely understand it. And I confess, I, this also happened after I had a brain injury, which I had three years ago, and I'm much, much better. And uh, the, the very intense sort of loudness and rhythm is a little hard for me with my, with my new situation. But there's a lot that's interesting there. And, you know, look back on 1966, and, uh, you know, a, a, a perfectly fine composer won the Pulitzer Prize for that year, um, Leslie Bassett. Um, and certainly nothing against Leslie Bassett, but that was also the year of Pet Sounds. And, you know, Pet Sounds is now, you know, recognized as an absolute extraordinary American classic and I, I like the idea that, the, that the, the Pulitzer stretches a bit. I've been a Pulitzer judge five times um, and I'm, I'm all in favor. I understand composers who think, well, this is the last thing we have. Well, that's not entirely true. There's the Grau Meyer. Mm -hmm. There are a number of groups around which specifically honor contemporary music. But the Pulitzer is special, and it should say something about America and about American music and the idea that it was just going to more and more hyperchromatic um, people after that, that kind of chromaticism was just kind of gone, or not gone, but, but certainly was not dominant on any level, not even the classical level. I'm, I'm fine with Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Other, uh, let's go over here and then we'll go up there. When you begin to write about music that is new to you, how do you begin to write about it? Um, I'm very careful. Uh, I realize that a lot of music will not reveal itself to me um, on a very first listen. So I try to judge with some interest. Um, some uh, respect for the artist. Uh, and then sometimes I look at a score, but especially since my brain injury, I, I, I do not read scores the way I used to be able to read them. Uh, if I can listen to it again after it's over, if it's on YouTube or something like that, I, I will do that. But most of the time, when I was at the Washington Post, the Washington Post still wanted reviews overnight. So a concert would end, and I would have till 10.15 to you know, send out all my thoughts about what I just heard. So I, I, tried to be, I tried to make some actual 
concrete comments about it, and then to, to say perhaps something like, on a first hearing, it seemed this or that. Um, um, and I, you know, I learned that late because when I was a young critic, I was really kind of a robust Pierre, you know, like young critics are, you know, just this sort of like, I know what the world should be like, rah, 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 <laughs> you know, and, you know, as, as I grew older and recognized my mortality, the, the humanity of the person who I was reviewing, the, the circumstances, the times, I'm trying to not make this too fancy, but, and, and, and then I would just try to listen to it as itself, see what I could glean from it, see what might be of some interest to my audience, and then I would, I, I would just have to rush into print. I, I don't, I, I've, there are two books of my criticism out. One of them I'd love to just tear up and get off the map, but I rather like the second one, which is called Tim Page on Music. Very little of my on-deadline writing got into that book because I like to have more time to think. I have the perfect job now. I, 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 I'm a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, um, and that gives me a long time to write really smart articles. They don't say, cut this all out. They say, well, you want to go on to 3,500 words? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, now that I'm not a staff critic, I get to pick and choose what I want to write about. And I generally don't accept assignments unless I think there's going to be something that really interests me in the performance. So, or, or in the book, or, or something like that. I don't go out and hear operas that I know I don't particularly like mm -hmm. and have to try to find something to say about my 30th or 40th Madam Butterfly. I've said that <laughs> all, you know? So, and, and, you know, so, 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 so I guess that's the best answer I can give you. We have one back up here. And they ask, while newspapers and media companies have declined in coverage of classical music, do you think this creates an opportunity for young musicians to create discourse and support for the art form? And what do you see of the challenges and advantages of this? Well, the challenges, alas, especially now that you have the medium at your disposal, um, the, 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 the challenges are how to fund it, how to make money, how to keep going, how to you know, manage things. I mean, people forget that, you know, Steve Reich and Phil Glass, when I met them, they were driving taxis mm. to make a living. They were just struggling by to get things. As for the younger generation, the young generation, the s still even younger generation, I'm actually pretty thrilled by them because uh, there aren't the same, you know, constricted clubs that say, well, we might think about doing one of your pieces sometime. You know, you get together. You find a place who will let you play your music. You tell people about it. You use social media. You, you just try to do cool things. I mean, this is Baltimore. All over Baltimore, there are fantastic spaces where you can go and you can do something really, really interesting. You can make your own recordings. You can get them online, you know. J just be entrepreneurs. Be, be visionaries. Visionaries is a little weird with the ear, but be the oral <laughs> equivalent of visionaries, and go out and do it. You know, you've got the energy. You're in a city where it's not going to break, break you, and you're going to probably find some places which would be thrilled to have you come in and put on a concert or something like that. It's not like New York. New York was like that 40 years ago, and it was fabulous. It's the reason New York became such a haven for creativity. Uh, Patti Smith said something wonderful not that long ago, where she said, if I were talking to a young artist, and, sh and she spent a lot of time in New Jersey, and especially in Michigan, where she's lived pretty much from since she was doing the whole concert circuit all the time. She said, if I were talking to a young musician, I would tell that young musician to move to Detroit. Mm -hmm. And because there you can find other people who are interested in these things. 
And Baltimore, in my opinion, I, I like Detroit very much, but Baltimore, I actually think, has it all over Detroit. Mm -hmm. And I think there are tons of places you could go, and there are tons of things you could do here. And I just hope you go out and do them. And do them in the city you're in. And make recordings, and don't bulk your tapes with interviews with, with great people who would no longer be there. You know, Virgil Thompson once said, um, he did these two wonderful operas with Gertrude Stein. And it was a tough collaboration. They were both people who really knew this. Another Baltimorean, Gertrude Stein. And they both knew what they were doing. But Virgil later said, um, I'm sorry I didn't write an opera with her every year. It had never occurred to me that we would not both always be living. <laughs> So you want to do something with somebody? If there's, if there's some older composer that you think is particularly special, get to that composer. A lot, I get to that artist. A lot of them are just sitting around in, in apartments feeling that the world has forgotten them. And if you know something about their work and something about their art, go there. They'll welcome you. You'll probably make their year. And I just wish I'd done it more when I first got here because I wasn't knocking on doors for maybe the first five, ten years I was here but, uh, in, in, in New York. But go get them. Go get them. You, you have to remake the music business. It's a wonderful art. It's been a really tough business for a long time. And maybe we can do a more humane and diverse and historically understanding view of, um, of what the future of music will be. Over here. Hi, I'm uh, actually a music critic in Baltimore. How um, terrific. Currently not getting published very often yeah. because we have such an interesting situation of, I think, you were talking about radio earlier and the role that radio played in, in your activities and, and how influential that could be. And we have a really wonderful classical music station, the WBJC. We have a I think the first time in 20 years they hired a, a young, like 30-something, to be curating the late night. And, How terrific. And he'll dig in the archives and find out stuff. John Search, amazing. Always request something from him, he'll find it. Um, so I feel like he's a great ally, the station is a great ally, but in terms of any of the outlets, uh, I've been specifically told I'm never allowed to write a review anymore. They will not publish a review. They will only publish a feature an advanced story or a if there's a political angle to the composer or sure. something in that range. Um, and so coming up against that wall over and over again, uh, I just started to want to put on concerts uh, myself and start a music series and you know work small, take advantage of what you are absolutely correct that Baltimore has in, in space. Um, but I guess how do you recommend I go from being this quasi empresario with several concert series and being on the board of, it, of an ensemble occasional symphony. And, and we get to the point where it's like we're all doing these wonderful things and they're all s small but growing. And then they, there's that stage that you have to, in order to continue on to your next five years of right, music right. group or performer, um, you, you get to the point where if you haven't gotten a certain amount of media coverage, you can't apply for grants. If you can't apply for grants, right, you can't right. get beyond doing a $2,000 show. Uh, so I don't know. I just, I'd love your read on this particular window of this situation into town that obviously you seem to understand and love. <laughs> well, I, 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 I certainly love it, and I understand it mostly. <laughs> and I, it, my, my memories are, are somewhat older. The first thing we got to do is you and I have to exchange emails. Yes. And then we've got to have a bunch of phone conversations. Uh, and uh, I have a lot of ideas. You know, a lot of newspapers only want to do, um, only want to do advanced features or news items. The idea of reviews, they don't understand, and they probably don't care actually, that this is the history, this is the living history as told at the time mm -hmm. by the people who actually went to events. I would say you probably aren't going to win them over necessarily, but you can blog. And you know, you won't make money on the blog. Even, even Alex Ross and Terry Keachout and these people who've been doing 
blogs for years don't make money on their blogs, but they help bring attention to the music that they care about, and they also bring attention to the uh, attention to the writer. And so I think I think it's a tour. Actually, since you also are an impresario, I think I think it's a two or three pronged thing. But if, if you've got the energy and the uh, and the ideas, I think a place like this is much more likely to help you with those ideas. I have to say for where I live, Los Angeles is becoming a very, very interesting city. But that's because it's so huge and it can just grow out forever. I mm. sometimes think the, the border of Los Angeles is going to be Nevada soon, you know? <laughs> it just grows, mm. you know? But the nice thing is that people can still, if they're willing not to live in the fancy places, um, they, they can still find some place that they can do things. There's a very interesting and lively art scene there that is really gone from New York and gone from the, uh, so many of the East Coast cities. Performance. I, I, I'm going to have to ask you. Tell me. What again. do you think are the best qualities of a great performer or performance? Uh, what are the best qualities of a performer or a performance? Um, I have to say that it. I mean, I can think of absolutely perfect performances that bore me to tears. I can think of some old recordings where there are all sorts of mistakes, where they're using piano instead of harpsichord uh, in, in you know Baroque ensemble of the Brandenburg concertos, which will move me to tears. Um, I think it's something uniquely other. It, it, it will, I mean, technique is very, very important, as is historical knowledge. But there's some people who are just so amazingly musical and have this very quirky quality, um, and and you know manage to do something very special that you can certainly, you know, um, mark debits here and there. You know, maybe they didn't hit all the notes perfectly, but the 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 spirit of it. I mean, you, you are reminding me what, one of the most profoundly musical um, events I ever had, one that brought me to tears, uh, was some friends of mine who really know not much about music. Uh, I mean, they know enough. They certainly know enough. They, they support concerts. They go to concerts. But when they got married about 30 years ago, they decided to have a dear friend of theirs who was a, you know, a sort of folk singer, um, mezzo-soprano, um, and she decided of all things to play the guitar and sing one of Sarastro's arias from the Magic Flute, you know, wrong fach, wrong, you know, instrument, not really an understanding of, of the music, but it was, it was sung so very beautifully that it, it moved me profoundly. Um, and you often find this, people who just go into music that they quote unquote shouldn't be doing, but something very special happens when they, when they do it. And this doesn't mean I never want to see a real live magic flute again, because I do, and I want to hear Sarastro sung by a bass. But it was so beautiful on that day to listen to this, this woman who... who you know, who didn't hit all the notes perfectly and was accompanying on guitar. Uh, and all, all I can say, I was just moved beyond words and I was, I was, I was very happy. Yes? Uh, in terms of reviewing or even just appreciating art, where would you say you fall on the spectrum of the need to separate the art from the artist, if the art is excellent and the person is not. <laughs> well, that 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 is obviously a tough one. Um, as for art and artists, um, if they are living artists, in general, at least when I was a music critic, I, I tried not to really know them. 
uh, and it wasn't because I was going to give them, you know, pats on the head and all this stuff. I mean, it was very funny with Philip Glass because I loved his early music, and he went through a period where I really didn't like much of anything he was writing, and I was still writing about that. And then what happened was I heard one of his operas, The Fall of the House of Usher, and I didn't like it at all, and I wrote a review of it. And then about three months later, I heard it on NPR, and I was listening to it, and I was kind of caught up by it. And so the next time I saw Philip, who was a friend before I was a critic, um, I said, you know, I'm not going to write about you anymore. Because I think our friendship, I, I'm so determined not to be, you know, your shill or something <laughs> like that, that I think I'm going in the other direction. And he was hilarious about it. He's a very funny, informal man. And so I said, so I'm not going to write about your new work anymore. I'm, I'm taking myself out of this. And he was hilarious. He, he looked at me and says, oh, that's okay, Tim. I don't like everything you write either. <laughs> <laughs> Which Fair I enough. thought was great. Now, when you're talking about people who were sort of awful, with, with classical music, you, you, you learn, I mean, very early in your in your experiences of classical music, you have to come to terms with Richard Wagner. And, you know, that's a monster, you know, in many, many ways. I mean, he wasn't as much of a monster as some of the people we've had since, but there are a lot of reasons to really, really dislike his music. But then there's the music, you know, and I'm really sorry for people who can't put aside the actual response to the music, if, if you're listening to Wotan's Farewell, you know, whenever, whenever you're saying goodbye to a youth that you, that you really love. I, I happen to be a family man. I have three kids. Um, and it's, it's all Wotan, you know, putting Brynhilde in a spell, which is not the nicest thing in the world to do. Um, <laughs> But, but it's this farewell and the, and the pride there and the ache. And, ju you know, just thinking of the music has me like this. Whereas, you know, we all know people who are lovely, lovely people who, you know, don't have that extraordinary gift. They usually find their way into music, too, and manage to do very great music. But my own rule is to is to trust the art and not the artist. And then if the art is, has its own problems, you know, then you have to deal somewhat with that. It's complicated, but um, I'm not one of these people who says that um, we should not listen to art by bad people because then you get rid of an awful lot of art. You know, artists don't tend all the time to be the most stable and easygoing of people. And in a weird way, it's almost like a, a, a certain triumph that somehow through their crossness and crazy ideas that they manage to do things that are, are really, really special to us and mean something to us. So I have to ask you, um, we've had recently over the last year a spate of falls in the in the field of classical music around the Me Too movement, and that's all sort of come to the fore, including some folks with you know that have had huge and long careers and just so. How do you how do you how do you parse that? It has to be person by person, yeah. and I think everybody has to make up their idea about what they can stand. I mean. The, the, I, I was surprised at the class I teach at, at USC, which is about arts journalism. Um, and I was very startled by the fact that um, a number of my students not only hadn't seen Chinatown, but were never, ever going to see Chinatown. And there's no film that tells you more about the history of Los Angeles, the glamour, the darkness, the ugliness. And it's also whatever Polanski did or did not do himself, and there's, there's still some, 
some argument about that, and the woman who was involved, anyway, I'm not even going to go into the details, but I would say that Chinatown is a film about the rape of innocence, and that it's an extraordinarily powerful film, standing very much on the side of the victims uh, in this situation. And I'm not going to condone anything that Polanski has necessarily done. I'm not going to get into Levine and Dutois, if, if, except to say that it's, you know, uh, if, if they were working at, if I were in your job and they were working here, they would, of course, in my opinion, be fired. Yeah. Um, and, but I also come from an era where, where there was a lot of, stuff going on which would not pass at all now and should not have passed then. Um, so so I, I, I have to say it's, uh, it, it really kind of has to be a case-by-case -case basis unless it is so profoundly awful that you just say no more. But then if I listen to a recording, I mean, how do you deal with James Levine? who also led some of the greatest opera singers in the world who and, and a great, great orchestra. And back then, people didn't know about this. And you want to hear Cheryl Milnes. You want to hear Placido Domingo. You want to hear Leontine Price in their prime in this work. I'm going to listen to those recordings. It's as simple as that, realizing the ugliness of, of what was going on. So I hope I've given you, I've given you about 10 answers, and I hope one of them is, is maybe helpful. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah? What do you think about the work of Bruno Mont Saint Jean with uh, Glenn Gould? Bruno Mont Saint Jean, this no. film? Uh, hmm. Bruno Mont Saint Jean. Um, He's a, he's a gifted man. Um, I like very much his Goldberg variations. I did not like his film uh, about Glenn because it seemed much more about Mont Saint Jean than it did about the real Glenn. Mm -hmm. It was the same idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know, I mean, he's he's done some very very good work. Um, uh, we had some quarrels because we were doing some Glenn Gould material. So I'm, you know, we aren't, we aren't close friends. I would certainly be polite to him if I saw him, and I think he'd be polite to me. I'm very grateful for his film on the Goldberg Variations and for his work with Menuhin and for his work with Richter mm. and many other things. You know, no artist is always at their very best. And uh, his very best is, it seems to me, quite commendable. I just went to Detroit, and I met we have plans to invite him here one day. Um. I, I, I think it's a very good idea. I think you should listen to everybody you can. And that's another thing I, I believe about music. Uh, when, when I was a kid, if you were a classical musician and you like jazz was sort of okay. And eventually the Beatles became sort of okay. But you were looked at very, very you know, strangely, if you said that you really love this new pop single. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I'm honest. The only, one thing I have to be is if I like something, if I respond to it, uh, positive or negative, um, I, will, I will say something if someone asks me. I, I, I don't really censor myself on that much anymore. I think I'm a little bit more, more um, careful than I was, though. I mean, I, there's a lot of my early writing which I really wish didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> See, now I want to go read that. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> like... it, it's, it's, not only, it's not only not very good, but it's, it's, it's just ponderous. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a young guy remaking the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, young guys you know, are not meant to remake the world <laughs> and shouldn't think that they could. And I felt it was necessary to say in reviews of other masterpieces, 
well, not quite to my taste. You know, I mean, <laughs> all, the, all these things you outgrow if you are a, a serious critic and you learn about the, about the world. Okay. Um, maybe you just covered this, but I've always wondered how critics write a review of music that they've never heard before. I, I, it, I could never fathom that because I myself, I don't know if I like the simplest ditty the first time I hear it. And so here we have a critic going to a concert, hearing this big piece, it's new or has never heard it, and he writes this big review. So you said something about how you feel about it, but do you know in general how critics go about doing that sort of thing? Well, well, well there are two ways. There are critics who believe that you should attend all the rehearsals, that you should have a score, that you should do all these things. For a daily music critic, that just won't work. It, it, it's fine when it's Alex Ross, who's a wonderful critic. It's fine when uh, Andrew Porter, who was also a wonderful critic. But you know, they had a week to work on their, on their reviews, or longer. Alex will sometimes work you know, up to a month on a piece. Uh, and that's a very different thing. I tread gently, as I said before, but I do have, I, I am often very responsive to something immediately, or at least notice that there's something that's curious and interesting there and that I want to speak about. Um, so uh, again, as I say, I do try to tread gently. And I do realize that I'm not going to get everything the first time. And sometimes if I'm absolutely confused, I'll say I was absolutely confused. And there's no real, there's nothing really awful in that. Just say on a first hearing, I, I, I was baffled. There was this, but there was this, but there was this, but, you know, and, and, and you go on. And then you hope for another encounter with the piece most of the time. And, uh, and maybe you'll have some more insights the second time. So I just want to ask you, just before we wrap up, what advice do you have for students here, your own students, I mean, going out into the world, going out into the, whether they're going out as writers or going out as musicians, what, 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 you know, what are the one or two things you think they should not, well, not forget? I will share a... I will share a hint about writing that pretty much any of you who try it will discover that you're a much, much better writer than you were before if you do it. I tell my class this in Los Angeles. I tell other people this, and usually people don't take my word for it. But I have my class all year, and I can tell the moment that they're finally listening to me on this. When you write a piece of criticism, when you write a piece of anything, read it aloud. Mm. Read it aloud to yourself. You will catch all sorts of boring, question, boring sentences. You will catch repetitions of words. Read it seriously, too. Read it as if it's a speech or part of a play, or a sermon, or something you are trying to get across to people, and then listen to yourself. Catch all the things that you're doing wrong. If you can and you have a friend, read it to the friend. But I promise you, as good a writer as you are now, if you read your work aloud, you will become a much, much better writer, especially those of you who are musicians. Because there is music in the spoken word, you know? And it doesn't just have to be Shakespeare and Tennyson to mention the two who I really think have an absolute mastery of making words into music. Um, so read your work aloud. That will help enormously. Um, sleep on it if you can, because you will be a different person in the morning when you read it aloud once more. And you will catch different things. As for musicians, listen to everything. Listen and try to come to terms with it. Even if it's a kind of music that you think you don't like, even if it's music where you know, your initial reaction is, oh, that's just noise. Well, noise can be pretty darned interesting, too. One of my assignments for my class is towards the end of the year, 
I tell them to walk around the USC campus and find music. And it can be something as simple as going and talking to somebody practicing guitar by the fountain. Or it can be somebody going to a, to a practice room. And I mean, before this, I was just listening to a wonderful piccolo player play again and again the final part of the Beethoven Ninth. And I was just loving it. I was loving just hearing the piccolo alone and thinking about how unusual it was and trying to hear the piccolo part without the rest of the Beethoven Ninth. So, and then you can also, I mean, I've had people who went out and they sat by the corner of Hoover and Jefferson, uh, which is the big intersection just north of USC, and they've just listened to buses for the day, or they've listened to sirens, and they've just written me a prose poem about this. So listen to everything, read your work aloud, and I promise you will be a better musician and you will be a better writer very, very quickly after you start making this part of your habit. Um, and um, all I can say is I wish you all all the best in the world, and it's a great, great honor to talk with you today. Tim, it's a pleasure to have you back here. Thank you so much, Chris. It was great. Thank you. Thank you.